Hey, welcome back, uh, First Assembly, to our Wednesday night Bible study. And tonight we will be finishing up chapter 6. Last week we kind of wrapped up with the 12 apostles being sent out two by two, remember? And it was interesting that God had taken them to a place of really trusting in Him. And we finished up with trusting the Lord with all your heart because, you know, normally on a missions trip we would go out, we would take luggage after luggage and all the, all the stuff that we needed to go to that country here. God says, take the bare minimums, take the bare minimum and, and trust in me. And this week we're going to, we're going to finish up, but it's interesting though, um, that in the book of Mark, Mark decides to throw in the death of John the Baptist. Here we see that Jesus sends out the 12 apostles and then right after the death of John the Baptist, why, why, what, you know, he tells us the story of what happened. We go to right into Jesus feeds the 5,000. Kind of just, you know, put a question mark above my head. Mark, why did you add this in between two places that there was going to be ministry for the disciples and a ministry again for the disciples? But let's get right into uh, Mark chapter 6, verse 14. We're going to read it all the way through, and then we'll come back and pull it apart a little bit. It says, King Herod heard of it, and Jesus' name had become known some, and said, John the Baptist has been raised from the dead, and that the, this is why these miracle or miraculous powers are at work in him um, but the others said no it's Elijah and the others said he's a prophet like the one prophets of old but when Herod heard of it he said John who might be headed has been raised for it was Herod who had sent and seized John and bound him in prison for the sake of Herodias his brother's Philip's wife because he had married her for John had been saying to Herod it is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife and Herodias had a grudge against him and wanted to put him to put him I'm sorry I can't speak tonight to put him to death but she could not for Herod feared John knowing that he was a righteous and holy man and kept him safe when he heard of him he was greatly perplexed and yet heard him with glad gladly so it's kind of interesting when you think just in this little section that um, that Herod liked John that Herod listened to John but it goes on in verse 21 and says, But an opportunity came when Herod on his birthday or on his birthday gave a banquet for his nobles and military commanders and leading men of Galilee. For when Herodias' daughter came in and danced, she pleased Herod and his guests. And the king said to the girl, Ask me for whatever you wish, and I will give it to you. And he vowed to her, Whatever you ask, I will give up to half of my kingdom. I mean, no, that's a lot. And she said, and she went out and, and said to her, Mother, for what should I ask? And, and she said, The head of John the Baptist. And she came immediately with haste to the king and asked, saying, I want you to give me at once, demanding young lady, isn't she, the head of John the Baptist on a platter. And the king was exceedingly sorry, but because of his oath and his guests, he did not want to break his word to her. And immediately... The king sent the executioner with the orders to bring John's head. And he went and beheaded him in the prison and brought his head on a platter and gave it to the girl. And the girl gave it to her mother. When the disciples heard of it, they came and took his body and laid it in a tomb. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. And we thank you, Father, for what you're about to share with us today. Lord, we ask you to continually unveil your word to us, Father. Let our hearts be filled with your presence. And now, Lord, let us understand what you're trying to say in, this, in your word. In Jesus' name we pray, man. You know, you, you think about this, you know, when King the King heard in Jesus' name had become known, some said John the Baptist, and he has been raised from the dead. And, you know, that's why these miraculous powers are work with him. And others said that Elijah, and others said it was a prophet, like the other prophets of old, and why did, you know, even this, why did John, or why did Herod say, John, whom I beheaded, has been raised? Why did he think that? You know, a lot of times we think about this. People love to take guesses. There you have one that says, oh, it's, no, it's Elijah. No, 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 it's one of the prophets. Everyone has an opinion. <laughs> They're usually wrong when they use their own understanding, human understanding. But it's interesting that the next several verses, Mark does give us a history lesson with why John lost his head a lot of times you stand up for truth people don't like to hear it how many of us know that 
when maybe if we're wrong and someone comes and, and reveals to us we're wrong or the Holy Spirit reveals to us, you know, uh, you're wrong in this. How many notice that kind of bothers you? bothers you until you come to a place you humble yourself you know what yeah i was wrong but it's interesting it says in verse 17 for it was herod who had sent and seized john and bound him in prison for the sake of her as his brother philip's wife because he, he he married her it says he doesn't even consider even mark righteous he says he says it's his brother philip's wife not Herod's wife because he knew it was wrong mark didn't even call her his wife he stole his brother's wife but it goes on and down in verse 20 says that for Herod feared John knowing that he was a righteous and holy man and he kept him safe and we heard him he greatly perplexed and yet he heard him gladly Herod liked John see you get a sense he liked him he liked listening to him but he didn't he was lost he didn't understand what John was talking about now we're talking Herod Antipas, not uh, not Herod the Great. Herod the Great was the one that slaughtered all the babies, trying to kill the Messiah. If you remember, go back a little bit in the beginning. But it says, But an opportunity came when Herod on his birthday gave a banquet for his nobles and military commanders and leaders of men of Galilee. Now, I understand a big party, a lot of food, a lot of wine, a lot of people saying things and doing stupid things. Here's what's kind of what the culture was. And it said, For Herodias' daughter came in and danced and she pleased Herod and his guests and the king said to the girl ask me whatever you wish and I will give it to you now if I'm thinking of it's his brother so it's got to be his niece is actually dancing kind of kind of weird uh, that you get um, kind of these feelings for for a, um, a relative of yours it's kind of really think about it. it's kind of weird but he said in verse 23 he says and he vowed to her and says whatever you ask me I will give you up to half of my kingdom that was a lot. He's talking some serious um, coinage, if you, if you catch my phrase. And she went out and said to her mother, what should I ask? And she said, the, the head of John the Baptist. I understand the mother did not like John because John was revealing truth to her. It is wrong for what this is going on. It is wrong for you to have him. It is wrong for you, king, to have her. He he revealed he revealed their sin. He, he revealed their... Um, um, we'll say deprived lives and a lot of people don't like uh, when truth when the light comes on and truth is revealed people don't like that people don't like to see their you know could you imagine if take for instance if some of the things that in our lives that we didn't necessarily weren't the greatest parts of our lives were revealed to the public eye how do how would you feel I understand there's a lot of different people out there in this party and he's saying look She's not supposed to be your wife. You're not supposed to be married to her. It is a sin. It's wrong. Can you imagine how 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 she felt? The embarrassment, the the this the audacity of this man saying that. Can you think about her being prideful, arrogant, being in the positions that she's in? But it says in verse 27, immediately the king sent an execution with the orders to bring John's head, and he went and beheaded him in prison. That's, it, you really think about this pretty whacked out people passing a, a, around on a platter the head of a man it's just it's kind of weird you know you think about some of the weird stuff that we see today on TV what we watch and here they are doing it back then you know walking around on a, on a platter with, with the head of John the Baptist but it goes on in verse 29 and, and it says and the disciples heard of it he came and took his body and laid it in a tomb so John was just standing up for what is right and people don't like that People don't like to hear the truth. They don't like to hear the word of God. You know, when you start when you start reading the word of God, you know, when you go through your scriptures and and you see people's lifestyles and you and you see how people are acting and, and you just go point out, hey, look, this is what the word of God says. This is where truth is. This is where our absolute truth comes from, not our opinions. Like like some of the other ones were saying, oh, it's Elijah or a prophet. You know, and, and, and John and John points out their failures and their and their sin. No one likes that. But we, as a humble people, as Christians, should be saying, "Hey, you know, when we make a mistake, we need to own up to God and say, God, you know what? I was wrong. When I when I go against somebody, another brother in the Lord, or even somebody that's that's unsaved, what a witness to go up to them and say, "Hey, you know what? You know, I, I was wrong. Will you forgive me and make things right? You know, 
She could have said, you know what, you're right, and I'm going to go home to my husband. Or, I, you're right, I shouldn't be in this situation, but she didn't. She There was a just a, a hatred for just for John, because I think she loved the the lavish lifestyle. Come on, like, let's just be honest, humanly, who wouldn't? Who wouldn't like to be the, in a position of Herod and his, and his wife? Or not, I mean, think about it. People waiting on you, you get food, and whatever you wanted was given to you. And, and John points out, you're, you're wrong, you're, you're in a bad place. So that's kind of like why John got his head cut off. Why um, Mark puts it here, I don't know. But then Mark picks back up with the apostles being sent out in the authority once again. And here we see that Jesus is about to feed the 5,000. So understand, remember now, these guys just came back from, from a missionary's trip. And they're probably excited. They're probably all stoked up. They're probably saying, hey, listen, Jesus, this is all that was happening on this trip. You know, can you, if you ever been on a missions trip, can you imagine what you experienced down there, how God met your needs, how God moved down there, and then what did you do? You came back and you probably shared with a bunch of people. You probably had an opportunity to share up front in front of the church, maybe, and say, hey, this is what God was doing here. And you, you were excited. And this is what part what's going on with where, when, when these guys all met back up. But in verse 30, it says this, the apostles returned to Jesus and told him all they had done and taught. And we said to him, Come away by yourself in a desolate place and rest for a while. For many were coming and going, and they had no leisure even to eat. And they went away in a boat, and they went away in a boat to a desolate place by themselves. Now listen, God knows us better than ourselves, and he knows that when we need a rest, we need to take a day of recharge. Even if you're in ministry, you're not in ministry, there's been times that even when I worked and worked, and got my money in in the world. I got, but you know, I, I worked at a secular job, but I did ministry at night or did ministry to, and I got my finances, you know, ultimately from God. But I worked in the world. Even then, you need a take a rest. You need to. You don't want to get burned out. And some some people just never take a rest, and they and they get a burned out. And he says, "Come away by yourself to a desolate place and rest for a while." I, I can imagine them being with Jesus. Think about this. How many of us would just like to go with Jesus and just like chill out? Just hang out with him, relax. Don't do a thing and just, just sit in, at Jesus' feet or just, you know, sit at the table and eat with him. Just, you know, can't say lay at a beach and, you know, with an umbrella with him. But listen, go and just reflect on the fact that you need a break. We Sometimes we just need to get a break. I, mean, I can remember taking work in times that I worked 70 hours in a week, and that's a lot. There are times I just come home from work and just collapse, you know, and this, and this, and let God restore you. See, we need to take that time to let God restore us. But it's interesting because the scriptures can go on because it doesn't seem like these guys get this rest. Because in verse thirty-three it says, "So now many saw them going and recognized them, and they ran there on the foot from the, all the towns and got there ahead of them." It was amazing that people already seen them and they were at the place where they were going to get the rest. But it's interesting because you know Jesus' heart because it says when he went ashore, verse 34, he saw a great crowd and he had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. And he, Jesus meaning, began to teach them many things. First and foremost, how would you love to sit at Jesus' feet and just listen to what he has to say? I can't wait to experience that when we get to heaven. I don't know how it's going to be up there, but I just want to hang out with Jesus. Hear what he got to say. You know, Jesus sees others, though, differently than we do, don't we? Jesus had compassion. How many of us, listen, we plan a vacation, you see people in need, you're like, oh, I'm on vacation right now. I'm going to head to the beach because I need it. God will send somebody else there. You know, I'm here for a different purpose. I'm here to get relaxed. God told me to, but yet, hmm. This person over here needs help. Ah, someone else will come along. Kind of reminds you of the Good Samaritan. Here you see Jesus, though. sees they need compassion. Says, hey, look, they don't have a shepherd. They're going to want to run wild. And, But think about this. What happens when sheep don't have a shepherd? It's, it's just, The dangerous part here is this. People tend to surrender to those who show concern to them, which can be dangerous even today for us. There are many shepherds out there, and when people don't have a like a a gen, like a, a number one shepherd, we know that Jesus is our number one shepherd for, first and foremost. But when they don't have a, like a, a a shepherd that teaches them on a continual basis, how do they know what is truth and what is what is genuine out there? And here they don't have anybody, so they're going to be feeding off 
whoever has forgiven them and shown them love and, 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 and compassion. It's interesting, when we think about shepherds, I, I think about David. Remember David, King David, how he, he experienced uh, shepherd or shepherding uh, in two different ways. He showed one for himself. He was a young shepherd boy who, who shepherded actual sheep. And then God gave him the responsibility to, sh to shepherd God's people. Uh, so it's interesting that God was training David and, and <laughs> with farm animals. And then, okay, now take what I've taught you here and, and go and do this to my people. They're, they they will be sheep. And I love in, in Psalm 23, the, the Lord the Lord is my shepherd, uh, Psalm. And it, when even when David really cries out in his heart, he says, "The Lord is my shepherd; I shall not want." You know, David is saying, "Listen, I need a shepherd, and I know that I won't have a need because God is my shepherd. He's the one's doing the shepherding. I will not lack anything." Because it goes on and says, He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for His name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of shadow of death, I will fear no evil for you are with me. Your rod, your staff, they come for me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. You know, it's, how many of us know it's, you know, when he says he makes me lay down in green pasture, leaves me beside still waters. God brings us to a place of rest and peace. You know, some of us can look in our, look in our own lives and, and see all the things that we're facing and the, and the struggles that we're facing here. David saying, listen, I know I can trust in God. I know that I, I can get that peace I need. I know that I can find rest in him. You know, and he, and he continues, he goes on, and he restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. You know, has your soul been restored? You know, think about this. When, 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 when you go to sleep at night, do you have to take something? Do you have to drink something? Do you have to, you know, um, you know a lot of people, uh, what is it, that, the, the oils, the essential, they blow off the essential oils. And what brings you peace? What you know, do we have to take drugs to go to sleep? Do we have to have something to, you know, outside of God to, to um, bring you peace? You know, what do you do when you're weary? What do you do when you're when you can't go on? Think about, you know, I I I I, I know a Christian. He he's a he's a great brother in the Lord. He loves Jesus, uh, and there's times he'd go to me, you know. You know he he gets restless. He he can't sleep, and he just he doesn't know he does not know how to relax. He does not how to get rid of that weariness. So he goes on. He has a couple glasses of wine every with his wife every once in a while. And I'm not condemning him, uh, but I'm not condoning it. But I'm saying I asked him one day, and I said, "Why do you drink? The, why do you do that?" He said, "Well, it kind of relaxes me. It brings me to a place of peace and rest." I say, "Did you ever think about asking the Holy Spirit?" And then he would say, well, he'd get offensive. He'd say, ah, you know, don't, don't talk to me at God's stuff. I'm like, that, that's how we need to find rest. And when you read the 23rd Psalm, you find how King David's life was a train wreck, but he knew he knew he can go to God and God would give him his rest. And, you know, maybe you're not in rest. Maybe you don't have peace. Maybe you're, not, you're in a place, go to God as David did. And, and read the 23rd Psalm and say, look at how David pours out his heart. He finds that rest. He finds... How we get to get rid of that weariness. Amen. And that's something we need to have to walk around with. We shouldn't be walking around weary and 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 and, and, un, and, un, and, un, and what is it? Restlessness. We should be walking with God. But now let's go back to the book of Mark. And you know that they came ashore um, and the great crowds, Jesus had compassion on these crowds, and Jesus is teaching them, he's loving on them, he's talking about the kingdom of God to them. And in verse 35, it starts off and it says, And it grew late. And the disciples came and saying, This is a desolate place, and the hour is now late. Send them away to the surrounding countryside and villages and buy themselves something to eat. But here we go. Think about this. But he answered, You give them something to eat. And he said to them, Shall we go buy 200 denarii worth of bread and give it to them to eat? And he said to them, How many loaves of, do you have? Go and see. 
And when they found out, they said, five loaves and two fish. Then he commanded them all to sit down in groups on the grass, green grass. So they sat down in groups by hundreds and by fifties. How many know that's a lot of people and you're needing a lot of food? Now understand, if you take out where, where Mark explains uh, John the Baptist part. So figure these guys are coming off of a, of, of a mission trip, short term mission trip. And they're excited and they're filled with the Spirit. In a sense, they're, they're, they've seen the miracles, they've seen uh, the signs, the one, they've seen it all, and they've seen God move mightily. Now Jesus challenges them, says, you give them something to eat. You do it. And their mind, they're thinking fleshly, there's a lot of people here, but we don't have the money for it. So think about the near, the 200 denarii is roughly a few months of wages. They're hungry and they need to eat. I mean, though, a, an angry mob we can see on TV, but they're not hungry. They, they want something different. But people do get hungry. And when people get hungry, you're like you're like a bear, man. Hey, give me some food. You know, you're like, how do you get when you're really hungry? You know? So here we think about this. What's going on here? There's thousands of people gathered together to hear Jesus. It's getting dark. There are no street lights. It's not like today. And the boys were meant to get some rest. But remember, Jesus had compassion on them, on the people when they came to Christ. But what does Jesus say? You feed them. And here we go. They got back from the missions trip. And here you see is, you know, you got two by two guys. They're coming off the mission field. God, you supplied for me then. But Lord, how are you going to supply me for 5,000 plus? All right, you trusted God on your missions trip for for uh, you too and whatever God did for you then now are you going to trust God when something gets bigger in your eyes you know let's are you trusting God for the provision on the mission trip now you have to trust him big and we had to understand listen there is no difference to God how many need fed the difference is in our faith if I could believe God to take care of me and my wife and listen when me and my wife first got married if I could believe God to provide enough uh, money to come in the home for me and my wife, right? Why would he not take care of when our family started growing? Many times I'm like, you, you have people, even in myself, and you have other people who look, they get married. Okay, do we have enough money to get married? Okay, okay. Now, do we have enough money to have children? So what happens? We put off having children because we don't have enough money. Now, I'm not saying if you're flat broke, if you, I mean, um, not to... You know, you, you do have to think about it, but if God's going to bless you with a child, God will give you the money to raise that child properly. As God gave you the money to get married, make sure your job was uh, enough to fund the, 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 to your wife and, and your lives, God will give you the money to raise a family. And sometimes we really have to take our minds off the, pit, or off the, the storm because on the missions trips, maybe they only seen two or three people they had to pray for at a, at a time. Now there's 5,000 plus because you got to figure they didn't count women or children. And the same way that God took care of us for the little things, God will take care of us for the big things. We think of a headache, God can take care of that. We think of cancer, God can take care of that. But in our minds, we're like, oh, man, how's God going to take care of this? It, it, can, it can be difficult for us if we're not in the right place with our faith with God, trusting in God. Imagine what it feels like to them, though, to have that much responsibility thrusted on them. Moments ago, they were all fired up. God, you did some great things when we were out in the mission field. But now, man, there's just so many people. They're endless. We begin to complain. We begin to whine. It's not going to happen. But God is saying nothing is impossible, nothing is impossible with God. But it's, it, it, it's interesting, though. In another note, we can say... And we can sing songs that say nothing's impossible for our God or with God. But wait till we have to put it in practice. That's when we see what's in the depths of our heart and what kind of faith we have. God is just stretching them even more. Listen, guys, I gave you a little bit. I showed you my faithfulness in your times of their mission trip. Why wouldn't I do this for this big trip? Look, at I put you in this position. You were going to get rest. People came in. 
I had showed compassion on them. Now, they need to eat. You do it. Philippians 4.19 says, And my God shall supply every need of yours according to his riches in the glory in Christ Jesus. God has enough in great abundance to pro for provision for us. Whether you're trying to raise a family, trust in God to do it. Maybe you're saying, well, I don't have enough money. Trust in God, pray, and, and you'll see God move. But it goes on in verse 41 through 44. It says in this, and Taking five loaves and two fish, he looked up to heaven, and he said, Blessing, and broke the loaves, and gave them to the disciples to set before the people. And he divided the two fish among them all. Two fish and 5,000 people. It's amazing. And these weren't whales. Okay? And they all ate and were satisfied. You need to do a little study on that word, satisfied. Because not only did Jesus feed them spiritually to be satisfied, and that's where you can get real satisfied. That's where we get our satis satisfying. He also, he also filled them and satisfied them physically. So even a lot of times when we think about we, when, when you, um, you see the story, it's not just a, there's a lot we can pull from the story, but here Jesus is teaching, he's filling them spiritually, now he's feeding them physically means more than just full. It means a speak. It speaks of, listen, a longing that the world has that will never be filled until Jesus enters into their heart. Only God's provision can fill us. Think about it. They were running around. They, they came. They met them at the town they were going to before they even got there. There was a longing for them to be made whole, to be healed. There was, a, there was a fervency to seek out Jesus. And, and, and God, and, and as, as Jesus is there, he said, you know what? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have compassion because they were here. They want, they need, and God filled them both. And he showed the disciples, listen, I know that God met you on your, but he also met us here with only five loaves and two fishes. Those in the world have an unsatisfied longing that can only be found in Christ. Listen, no amount of money will able or materialistic things will be able to fill the void that's in your heart. And if you're a believer in Christ and you have a void in your heart, you need to be start filling him that void with Jesus. Don't go to the things of the world to be filling it, but go to Jesus. That's why I kind of mentioned my buddy that I knew that uh, he had a couple glasses of wine to relax. I'm like, listen, don't go to the world for it. Go to Jesus for that, that to bring you that peace. I mean, I mean, that would be really an amazing thing to see. You know, all the people there that that got fed and got filled, both spiritually and physically. You know, I, I can remember going to some of these like years ago. We used to go. I used to go to men's conferences where the entire stadium was filled with men from. All different denominations, uh, Baptists, Methodists, Presbyterians, Pentecostals, I mean, all of them. And yet we were came together, we, we were taught, we, were, um, we, we sang, we worshipped, and then we, were, we, got, we got fed spiritually. And then, and then they had a lunch break, and boom, we got fed physically. You know, it's amazing to see if you ever have an opportunity, if you're a man or a woman, you can go to different conferences. Go to some of these things and just hear, I mean, thousands upon thousands upon thousands of men praising God. It's it's an amazing, it's an, it's amazing to hear. There's just a big, it's like a, almost like a holy hush to to hear all this. And and then, you know, even women, just a, I guess the women, can you, you experience that, but then come together as couples just praising Him and worshiping Him. That's why I love coming to worship because you can, you hear the people singing and praising to a God, a loving God, a merciful God who takes care of our needs. And after that, it goes on in, in verse 45. It says, Jesus walks on the water. I, I love this story. Uh, so let's read it all through verse 45. And we're going to go all the way down to verse 51. No, 52, sorry. It says, immediately he made his disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side, to Bethsaida, while he dismissed the crowd. And after he had taken leave of them, he went on the mountaintop to pray. When evening came, the boat was out on the sea, and he was alone on the land. And he saw that they were making great, or they were making headway painfully.
for the one that was against them and about the fourth watch um, of, the, of the night he came to them walking on the sea he meant to pass by them think about that but when they saw him walking on the sea they they thought it was a ghost and they cried out for they all saw him and were terrified but immediately he spoke to them and said take heart it is I do not be afraid and he got into the boat with them and he, the wind ceased and they were utterly astounded for they did not understand about the loaves and, but their hearts were hardened wow once again we see the disciples are again in a situation they're weathering a storm uh, they're both probably they're probably there's probably some frightening here you gotta understand it's windy it's wet it's rocky I don't know if you ever been on a boat when a storm like a, a boat like it was not a cruise ship it was you know just like kind of like a, a normal boat say I don't know maybe 60 foot long maybe about I don't know six foot wide but understand it's the winds blowing the water's rough and they're just they're not having a good experience and it was that Jesus because it says here uh, in verse 45 it says immediately he went made his disciples get in the boat and go before him to the other side to Bethsaida while he dismissed the cries okay listen guys you're, you're walking in obedience they're walking in obedience get in the boat he's saying no go now it's nothing they they weren't in sin they didn't do anything wrong they weren't being punished it's just okay boom Jesus is telling them what to do and that says you know in chapter 4 we can see that remember the one I think it's chapter 4 Jesus was asleep in the boat and this was a time that um, that Jesus was not with him here we see in chapter 4 he was with him sleeping and then we see this story he's at a mountainside praying while he takes him and says go but you get the sense that Jesus orchestrated this this kind of thing he knew it was going to happen um, you have to believe that Jesus knew that there was a wind and a storm coming. Uh, I don't believe that Jesus was caught off at all, on guard, off guard in any of this about the storm. Um, but I think sometimes for us to look at this story as they've gone through it, the storms for us are pictures of things that we have to deal with in life. You know, some of us can um, cause storms to come in our lives through bad choices, disobedience, maybe decisions we make. Think about, you know, there's going to be an upcoming sermon series on Jonah. Uh, look at Jonah. Some of the things that he's caught because of his decisions of, of walking away from God. And But some of the storms that we do face in life, listen, let's be honest, like Scripture, God will allow us to go into. Um, you, you think about, you know, why, does, why do we go through storms? Because we can become stronger on the other side. God's trying to teach us something. And so that we're able to talk to somebody that may be facing something that can't get through it. You know, why did Jesus uh, dismiss the cries and then send off his disciples off? John, and if we look in the book of John, it kind of tells us. Um, <clears throat> when you read these stories, you've got to really kind of read this, the Gospels all in one. Okay? If you have a parallel, you can get a, um, I don't know if I have it here. There it is. Something a little different I didn't, I could have pulled down earlier. Gospels paralleled. When you when you read the stories in here, it 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 shows you all what what's in the, each of the gospels. So it's an interesting book. You get uh, gospel parables. I got it in um, uh, when I was in uh, Bible college. But um, this is why John six fifteen says this: perceiving that they were about perceiving then that they were about to come and take him by force, meaning take Jesus by force to make him king. This is why Jesus withdrew again to the mountain by himself. Here you go. One, he went to see his father, because whenever Jesus withdrew, we knew he was talking to the father, but that we, we take that assumption. But if you remember at times that um, when Jesus fed the multitudes the, with the fish and the bread, um, they knew this was a miracle, and people get excited. If, if you've ever seen a miracle before, um, it is exciting to see things happen. You know, uh, I, there's there's a miracle even that when, even with my wife having, uh, you know, we have proof that she had cancer and we had the photos and, and the x-rays and all that different stuff they had, uh, all the tests said yes, but then 
the miracle was that she that God moved mightily in her life and they're looking at this Jesus saying well there is there was Jesus there was a talk about Jesus and then there was the Messiah talk and see they were taught from from even from young ages to look for the Messiah who would free them from Roman occupation and they're thinking okay this guy here is doing some miracles you know we see some great things happening Rome's really being a pain um, they're really putting, their, putting us under their thumb this Jesus guy fits the bill this is the one let's declare him king you know and, and when you start putting this all two to two together you start to think you know, why did Jesus do certain things because in verse 47 and 48 says this and when evening came the boat was out on the sea and he, and he was alone on the land and he saw that this is interesting he saw so he, had, he could see from where he was at that they were making headway but making it painfully for the wind was against them and it was about the fourth watch in the night he came to them walking on a sea in which he meant it says he meant to pass by them now these two verses will give us a lot of information to look at related to the battles that they faced and the battles that we face in life what are the difficulties that we face and the battles that we face that we fight in and go through in life what are some of them it says here um, making headway is painful it says he saw that we're making headway painfully fighting against the wind and the waves think about not only this the, the physical strength they were going because you understand uh, they're, they're, they were rowing they, they were going to be tossed back and forth the boat's moving there was a lot of fear going on and think about the mental stress and the anxiety they were facing along with the physical pains from just even in being in the boat and I, I think we can relate to that with you know all that we're facing what are some of the things that you're facing maybe they're not physical but maybe now think about the mental stress and anxiety you face family, jobs, marriage friends, life just life in general you know, think about it. Put yourself in their place. Because it goes on and says, the wind was against them, for the wind was against them. In the Greek, means hostile opposition. It was almost a, it was, you can think of this, it was almost a purpose, purposeful attack to prohibit them from reaching the other side, to the other side of what? A place of ministry. A lot of times when God has sends us out in the ministry field, or maybe it's the missions field, or maybe it's just in your own community, maybe it's your family, maybe you know God's asking you, I need you to share the gospel with somebody. I need you to do this. And all of a sudden you go, okay, I'm all for it, Jesus. We're going to get in the boat. We're going to go forward. And boom, you get hit with such an oppression. You get hit with opposition. And you're like, where in the world did this come from? Because a lot of times it's the enemy wanting to stop you from doing what God's asked you to do. And here we see these guys in a boat, they're walk, they're in obedience, they're not in a sinful place, and they know when they get to the other side, because Jesus has taught them, remember, they're on a mission trip. This is not like um, over a long, long time period. They're in a mission field, they come back, they got to feed 5,000, Jesus shows them another miracle, and boom, where are they at? They're already getting they're going on the next mission trip and boom they're getting attacked how many of us can relate to that feeling hostile opposition someday in our lives do we feel opposed in a lot of our situations or even some of our situations can you can you feel the presence of the enemy trying to stop you can you feel the opposition maybe you're trying to witness to somebody at work and somebody keeps on interrupting you you know or your boss keeps trying to pull you away from somebody you've been ministering to there's a lot of ways opposition can come to us the enemy is very intelligent what he does. But it says this. What the comforting part about this is, Jesus is on the mountain. These guys are in the boat. But it says Jesus could see them, right? It says he saw, who Jesus saw, that they were making headway painfully. Jesus was aware of the situation. Where Jesus was, he had probably a good view of them. So, But for us, sometimes it's easy to forget in our trials and our storms that we understand, though, we don't maybe see Jesus, but know that he's watching us. Sometimes, you know, think about even when the, the story when he was sleeping on the pillow. You know, hey, Jesus, we're about to die. You want to wake up? We're taking naps. What are you doing? Let's just be honest. 
You know, sometimes we do feel we're abandoned by God. God, where are you in the midst of my storm? I don't see you. I don't see you do anything. You know, and sometimes we say, you know, God, why aren't you speaking to me? And there's times that Jesus won't speak to us. You know why? Because he wants us to grow. It's time to grow up. These guys just seen some great miracles. Could they have caught, could they have caused the sea, the, the, a calmness to the storm? You have authority to call, to call peace to the storms that you face. You and I do. If you're a believer in Christ, you need the Holy Spirit lives inside you, dwells you, lives in you, teaches us and guides us. You know, don't, don't believe because we don't see Jesus. We don't hear Jesus that he's not there watching us and, and taking care of us. We forget too many times. Psalm 13, 1 and 2 says this, How long, O oh Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I take counsel my soul and have, have sorrow in my heart all day? How long shall my enemy be exalted over me? Listen, there are times we are going to go through some painful things. We need to ask God, God, where are you? Why aren't you here? Do you not see my pain? Do you not see my tears? But it's interesting when you think about the book of Matthew, in Matthew 10, it says this, in verse 29 through 31, Are not two sparrows sold for a penny, and not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your father? But even the hairs on whose head? Your head are all numbered. Fear not, therefore, you who are more valued than many sparrows. Basically, listen, don't be afraid when we lose, and don't lose hope. Don't get discouraged. God is aware of everything that me and you go through, and he will not forget you and I. Amen? We, got, we have to believe in that. It continues on and says, But the fourth watch of the night came to him, walking on the sea. He meant to pass by them. Now the fourth watch was the, probably the last watch, probably between 3 and 6 a.m. This is probably the most difficult uh, part of the night, even for me when I used to work at night shift. Um, you could get up to the first many hours, but you know when, it, when it's just those last few, it just you get so tired of working, you're like you're ready to fall asleep because your body naturally sleeps at night. It's it's like it's not a common thing. The weariness would have been very high on this boat. They were probably paying. They were probably praying for sunlight, and I, for me personally, I think it's it, it's at the most difficult point is where I believe God comes and rescues and encourages, embracing us because it says He walks on the water to get to them. Now most of these guys were fishermen, and they knew that um, that how the water would be and how the storms are. That and all of a sudden, that here you see Jesus coming take care of them on their breaking point he sees them on the water you know they first it says they see them as a ghost but when they heard his voice there's nothing there's nothing like hearing the voice of god in the midst of the storm you know because a lot of times in the storm our focus is off we're seeing this we're seeing that we're seeing this and all of a sudden the voice comes in because they weren't seeing clearly they're allowing the circumstance to to cause them not to see clearly but when Jesus spoke, they knew his voice and it brought peace. And you got these guys on boat, maybe some of them crying, screaming. Boom. In verse 50, it says, For they all saw him and they were terrified. But it means he spoke to them. He says, Take heart with his eye. Do not be afraid. Listen, something Mark tell, doesn't tell us that we know Peter did speak and call out to Jesus. When you think about this, go to the book of Matthew real quick for me. You have to understand why didn't why didn't Mark add this in to, the, to this? Because it says, for they saw him, it says, do not be afraid. Right? Then it breaks off to the next to, to the next section, right? Because it says, and he got into the boat with them, and the wind ceased, and they were astounded. And it says, for they did not understand about the loaves, but their hearts were hardened. That was written in, in, in the book of Mark, but this is something we see in, in the book of Matthew. Matthew 14, verses 27 through 33. It says, But immediately, 27 says this, But immediately Jesus spoke to him, saying, Take heart as I do not be afraid. And Peter, said, and Peter answered him, says, Lord, if it is you, command me to come out to you on the water. Well, listen, most people wouldn't do that. That, that takes a, that's a bold step, because listen, these guys were fearful. 
right? And Peter knew that, you can think, I think Peter knew who Jesus really was. And he says, listen, I see you out there, Lord, walking on the water. Give me some power. Give me some authority that I can do that. And he says, come. Verse 29, he says, come. So Peter got out of the boat, walked on water, and came to Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid and began to sink. And he cried out, Lord, save me. Jesus immediately reached out his hand, took him out of the hand, saying to him, Oh, you a little faith, why did you doubt? And when he got into the boat, the wind ceased. And those in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. It's interesting that Peter, Peter at the bulls and says, And I can see the other guy saying, Hey, sit down. It's, it's getting bad. We don't need you rocking the boat anymore. But Peter wanted that. He's seen who God was. He, I believe he knew Jesus, who Jesus was. We know that. It's a classic story of Peter. Outlandish to see Jesus walking on water. Now Peter asks, hey, let me do the same. But when Peter took his eyes off of Jesus, Peter sunk. And during the storms, during the problems in life, what do you have your eyes on? Some of the things we have our eyes on will, will either build our faith or deplete our faith. There are giants in the land and... And they missed out even in their promise. I remember, remember back in Numbers, where we had Joshua and we had Caleb who said, "Yes, let's go fight our, let's get the, let's go in, let's fight because God's with us." And here we have the other one saying, "No, no, no, we can't do that." When we focus on Jesus to an, to answer our problems, God is able to meet us right where we're at. Don't focus on the problems. And John six twenty one says, "And they were glad to take him into the boat and immediately." The boat was at the land which they were going, where they were going to. Once again, we see in the different in the different parallels. If you can get a parallel book, it's a, it's a good one to get of the Gospels. John says, as soon as Jesus got in the boat, it was almost like Star Trek. Man, they were beamed to the land. So you get these, you, you see these different things that each writer wrote in that others why we don't know, but it was just their different flavors. And but one thing that's important we need to go when you go back let's go back to the book of Mark verse uh, chapter 6 verse 52 it says for they did not understand about the loaves but their hearts were hardened why why didn't they get it why did they have that understanding were they why were they not connecting the dots whether Jesus was walking on water feeding 5,000 it didn't matter he was saying listen I am God you are limited in your thinking, but I am not. You know? And the same thing is for us. Why do we have such... Why do we allow this, even our own limits? To, to limit, to, we put our limitations on God. You know, God's not limited. We are. We need to change our thinking to kingdom thinking. And this is what he's trying to tell his disciples. Listen, I'm not limited by you. You know? I can do, I can do this stuff. Your own mind, you cannot. He was just trying to teach him, stretch your faith, believe in me, trust in me. You know who I am. You know, I will not allow you to fail. You know, it's almost like, you know, do you think if they would have started, if, it, if maybe one of them would have lifted the bread up and believed truly with his heart that God would have said, oh, you know, it's, it's my time. You know, God was teaching him how to walk, be imitators, like to, to do what he was doing. Because he knew that he would not be with us forever. Amen. So let's wrap up chapter 6. Uh, Jesus heals at the Gennesaret. And when he crossed over, they came to the land at the Gennesaret and more to the shore. And when he got out of the boat, people immediately recognized him. And they ran about the whole region and began to, to bring sick people on their beds to wherever they heard he was. Can you imagine this, the thousands of people that he had, he had ministered to? Can you imagine all the things that Jesus did that we haven't read in the, in the scriptures? He says, whenever he came to the villages, cities, countryside, they laid the sick in the marketplaces to implore him that they may touch even the fringe of his garment. So then the story, the stories are starting to carry through, and many, and as many as touched were made well. You know, even think about all the different people that had the faith to bring the people that couldn't get there, maybe because they were paralyzed or you know, they were sick, that they brought them on their beds and they said, Jesus healed his people. The faith and just imagine the multitudes of people that were running to Jesus. That it says he came in the villages and cities and countrysides, and he laid the sick in the marketplaces, implored them that they might even touch the fringe of his garment. You know, not that God uses 
clothing, but it's the point of contact of their faith. And that many as touched were made well. It's an amazing, uh, it's amazing stories that we can read in the Gospels of how God just shows His generosity, His compassion on people, and and just and just it's amazing to see all these things. And yet they didn't, they, they the, the, the disciples couldn't do it. They couldn't figure it out. You know, are we connecting the dots in God's uh, what God is doing in our lives? You know. Have we put our faith in Him? Have, has He been stretching our tent pegs? If we're a child of God, we have the authority to do the things He's called us to do, and we need to make sure we stand in we stand in His will when we do them. Though, you know, if God's saying do it, then do it. When God sent these guys out, He gave them the authority to do it, and they did it. Amen. That is chapter six. I suggest that you go back and reread chapter. One, two, three, four, five, and six, um, and and just continually just review over your mind this the greatness of our God, and that God will be with us even in our storms. Amen. Let's pray, Father. I thank you for your word tonight, and I and I pray, Lord, that your Spirit would continually speak to us as we go back to read your word. And Lord, I pray, Lord, you would speak to us even now, Father, of your faithfulness, your love, your mercy, your compassion, your, and your greatness. I ask, Lord, that you would just breathe on every situation that we're facing. Father, that you would just in, invade our lives, Father. And that, Lord, if there's a, anyone out there that has a, a, just even now facing some storms, Lord, that you would bring a peace to them, Lord, that they have not ever known. And Lord, if there's some out there that don't know you as Jesus, as as, as Lord and Savior, Father, I ask that they would call out to you even now, that they would receive you as Lord and Savior, and ask you to forgive them, them of their sins. And Father, that Lord, that and that Lord, that they would start to seek you out more and more, Father, and call you Lord and Savior. I thank you for everyone that came tonight and viewed this, Lord. In Jesus' name, we pray, Amen. Amen. Be blessed and have a great night.